Everyone help me welcome Dr. John Archie Pollock. The story I'm going to tell is about our ability to use tools and our abilities that emerge because we're human. And the first is that we have this fantastic ability to tell stories, to listen to stories, and that we can actually do those things with technology. And with that comes a, a profound responsibility, not only to keep telling good stories, but to do that with new and inventive technology as we, as we move forward. So first we have to think about this ability of tools. Tools are a wonderful thing, we all love to use them, but they all have to be invented. And if we're inventing tools, you have to plan, you have to think, you have to hypothesis, you have to experiment, uh, try things out, and then maybe disseminate the tools and share them in different ways. And the neat thing about tools is we think it's human, and in fact, we're not the only ones who um, use tools. Here's a, a macaque who's using a tool, He's using a stone to crack open a shellfish to eat. And you can see that very intent look that he has as he's getting ready to drop that stone on the shelf and making sure his toes are out of the way. And that's not the only technique that macaque used. Here's a, another, oops, it's a little too far. There we go. Here's another one using um, a slightly different technique. But if you look closely, you can see that they've got their fingers peeled away so as not to bang on them. That, that, again, that intent glare, gaze that they're using. Um, as we saw, there's uh, other tools, um, tool using animals, see, dolphin. Who knew a dolphin would use tools? This dolphin has taken a sponge from the ocean floor and used it to wrap around its snap so it can root around on the ocean floor to scare up fish that it likes to eat. And one of the really cool things is that this dolphin is actually going to teach its young how to do this. Elephants. Who knew? This elephant in the wild of Asia has torn off a branch and fashioned it just so, so it can swat flies around its head and not be eaten. And it's not just mammals who use tools. New Caledonian crow. This crow has taken sticks and fashioned them and bent them and smoothed them just right with its beak so it can pull insects and grubs out of trees instead of banging its head against it like a, like a woodpecker. Now, we know that humans have been using tools for a long time. We think about the Stone Age. And in fact, the Stone Age goes back a lot longer than a lot of people would think. Here's a stone tool from 3.3 million years ago. The genus Homo wasn't even invented yet. We didn't, we weren't even a glimmer of existence. So our very ancient ancestors not only used tools like we see these other animals using, but were fashioning tools, sharpening stones for all sorts of purposes. And one of the things that I think is really great is that humans, our ancient ancestors, invented the use of another tool which I think actually made us as special as we are compared to the other animals. There we go. Yes, a fire. Fire was a fantastic invention for humans, being able to control fire. Not only did it give us the ability to cook our food, it nourished our brains in better and different ways, or fashion tools in interesting ways using the fire. But for me, the more important thing about the fire is what we do when we are around the fire. I'm sure most of you have been to a campfire or by a fireplace. And first off, it makes you feel warm and safe and comfortable. The fire extends the day so that you can talk to people, maybe sing songs. And that's it. That's exactly the point. I think a million, a million and a half years ago, our ancient ancestors were doing just that. Around the fire, extending the day, they're talking about the events of the day, where there was danger, where there was good food to be found. How it was you sharpened that stone just so to pierce the animal that you're eating now so nicely by the fire. Now clearly, our ancient ancestors, when they got control of fire, didn't have the vocal cords and structure of their throat to speak like you and I. But you see, that's the point. As a scientist, I look at things as to why they would be. And to have language, we needed to have a selective pressure, a genetic reason to have language, to be able to use it the way we do. 
And having that fire, having that opportunity to talk across the fire, to share the events of the day, created that space that we would need for pushing us to be the better storyteller, the better listener, and with that, have a greater chance to, to, to survive. So the fire has this fantastic importance for us. Now, here we are leaping ahead in time, not from a million years ago, but just to 120,000 years ago, when our ancient ancestors are getting to the point of now they're homo sapiens, they're living in Africa, and the type of graphic that you may have seen before is looking at how the climate naturally changes. And, and with the change in temperature, the temperature is dropping at 120,000 years ago we, in the red line. We see the blue line that's also looking at the carbon dioxide level. And, you know, we know that nowadays we've got high carbon dioxide above 400 parts per million. And we're concerned as a society and culture that that's going to increase our temperature by maybe two degrees or so this century. We're concerned about that. And we can see that in ancient Africa, 120,000 years ago, our ancestors were facing a cooling of the environment. And that drove people to migrate. It drove them to leave Africa, to go to the Middle East, to go through Persia and into India. And then 75,000 years ago, Mount Toba blows up. Mount Toba is a giant volcano in Sumatra. And the photographs I have aren't Mount Toba. We, we weren't there to take pictures. There's a picture of pictures of Mount Pinatubo that blew up in 1991 in um, the Philippines. And when Pinatubo blew up, it actually changed the global temperatures just a little bit uh, that year. And when it blew up, you can see this tremendous ash cloud that's being spewed forth. Now, it's estimates that there was five cubic kilometers of ash put out of that Pinatubo vault volcano. So imagine the cross-country team running five kilometers in a straight line that way and five kilometers in a straight line that way, and somehow running five kilometers straight up. That cubic five kilometers, a huge pile of ash, is what was thrown into the atmosphere by Pinatubo. But when Mount Toba blew up, it wasn't five cubic kilometers. It was 2,800 cubic kilometers of ash. A huge, huge difference. And with that, there's a catastrophic change of the environment, and we can see it in this temperature graph, that the temperature dropped precipitously and lasted for thousands of years. Now, scientists have studied this in a variety of ways and estimated that there was indeed, what they're calling here very politely, a temperature anomaly. A temperature anomaly, um, we can see in the blue colors across Africa and the Middle East and Asia are dark blue. And what the peoples of the world and the animals of the world were facing is not just a two degree temperature drop, but a 20 or 30 degree temperature drop. And temperature drop that happened not over the course of a century or so, but over one year. That's a huge stressor. And with that, we know that animals like the chimpanzee, the orangutan, the macaque, the cheetah, the tiger, they all face what's called a genetic bottleneck. The population drops so precipitously low that they were almost extinct. And we can see that in their DNA, that there's very low genetic diversity and we can see that in their DNA. But it wasn't just these animals that were almost extinct. It was us. The human species, some estimates put at perhaps as little as 3,000 people worldwide that survived this catastrophic change of the environment. Now, I look at that and I say, well, what's next? What could possibly be next? And what was next is this. You see, the people that survived that Mount Toba eruption had to be really clever, had to be really inventive, had to be really imaginative to figure out how to survive. And they did. And we begin to see it in cave paintings like this from 40,000 years ago. And we know people have been doing art for a long time. There's evidence that people probably have been doing art for well over a million years, painting themselves, decorating their hair, painting their tools. But this type of art is wonderful. And not only is it wonderful to look at today, but we know that it's scientifically accurate. I mean, here's what that horse looks like today. The painters of that knew what they were doing and, and, and had beautiful accuracy. And they also had animation. You can see those arrows going straight to 
that course, which may have been the feast that they had that drove them to make this painting. We can see that there's stories being told in these paintings. And this type of storytelling through pictures became codified in things like this. We all know about Egyptian hieroglyphics, the picture stories, and cuneiform is really an extension of that. It's very tiny pictures um, that, are, that are drawn together to tell a story and, and carry the, the text. Well, if we look at some of the, the ancient hieroglyphics, like this is an ox, and the ancient uh, Egyptian Sumerian word would be alf, and then we have a kaf for a hand, you can see the five digits, a mem for water, or nun for snake. Well, it doesn't take much to modify these symbols to be this, that our af, a sound, is coming from that ancient ox. That mem, kaf, nun, these are all these ancient words that are codified. We take those sounds and give them symbols, and now we have this new technological invention of writing, which takes all that wonderful storytelling that we've been doing for a million of years and puts it in a format that we can pass on with more detail and more information. So what do I think? I think that our brains are involved very much for creating and manipulating tools. We're not alone with that. There are lots of other animals that can do that. I think that we're involved for storytelling and for listening. And we're really good at that in part because of having that fire story to, to work with. But again, I don't think we're alone with that. I think lots of other animals on the planet are really good storytellers. We just haven't cracked their languages. We don't know how to interpret it yet. I think we probably are really evolved for art, but we're not really evolved for reading and writing. Reading and writing from that alphabet is brand new. It's only a few thousand years old. It hasn't been around long enough to be driven into our DNA. And you see, for me, that's the problem. Every generation has to teach the next generation how to read and write. We have to be like that dolphin and share that technology. And sometimes we don't do a very good job of it. There we go. So here's a, a PISA study. Among 65 countries, the US ranked 24. These are all the countries that were better at teaching their children how to read. And it's not just the kids. Um, adults aren't much better. Here's a national adult uh, assessment of adult literacy which found in 1993 that there were 90 million adults who couldn't read effectively. That's a lot of people. And the study couldn't even test people who couldn't read um, because they have to be able to read to take the test. And by 2003, the study showed there was 110 million people who couldn't effectively read. And the study also showed that people as they were aging weren't as good at reading as they were 10 years ago. 80 per second ways. Like, how can you forget how to read I, mean, I thought it was like riding a bicycle. You forget how to read because of this thing. And your computer screen. You read a screen's worth of text and you're done. What you really need to do is keep reading good books, reading the newspaper when we just gave up the Tribune Review. So this led me to a couple of ideas that I, as a scientist, want to teach science not just to the students I have at college, but I want to teach science to everybody. So I work with museums and schools, and I felt that we could get over this reading problem by showing good movies. Movies that have really good stories. I know our brains are so good at listening to and paying attention to stories that we could use scientifically accurate visuals that were really rich in detail. And so we started doing that. We built stories around lots of different types of uh, visuals. Here's a, a beating heart. We use lots of different styles of art. A uh, heart with pencil drawing or computer graphic animation that lets us look at how light turns show photons can, can activate the neurons inside the retina and, and let us see the things that we see. We made stories about, um, here's a boy who's got a homework assignment to write about how we grow and is frustrated and, and figures out that, oh, I've got an imaginary fish who will help me figure out how to tell my story. And we, we didn't just do stories that were animated movies. Um, we did some things like this. This is a public art piece you might have seen at the Pittsburgh Zoo. Um, it's a big mural that looks at the evolution of life. And yes, it's a static picture, but when you go up to it and look at it and read it, you have four billion years of evolution that you can explore. And you can tell your own story about how different animals pick up the different types of 
of features and attributes that they have. We then moved on to using computers again as a way to create uh, video games that have text that you need to read and did lots of testing to find out how effective they were for kids to learn. Um, we made shows about bones and broken bones um, that let people explore a variety of different things. Um, and we also took these stories and made them into apps. Here's a again about bones where you can now tell your own story. You can go into this app and, and see that bone is made up of lots of different cell types. And as you poke those cells, you can find out what those cells are, a little paragraph, a little story about, about each part of the biology that's there. And um, within this realm, we've got the opportunity to make some, some successful TV shows. This, this show uh, won two Emmy Awards, and we were very pleased with that. It's a story about sleep and why we all need to sleep and don't get enough sleep. But it's, again, it's a TV show that is a, a way of communicating, and it doesn't challenge this, this reading and reinforce reading. So from there, we moved on to building another type of app that's depicted here. We're, it's called Bibliotech, and, and here we can um, tell a story that's uh, just a real book. It just happens to be on an iPad or a tablet. And you see that some of the words are highlighted, and they're words that we think the reader might not know. So when you tap them, you get instructions. You can keep track of these words, or you can get a definition, and you can drag those words into your digital notebook. And sometimes there'll be a picture that you like, so you can drag the picture into your digital notebook. And as you read through the story, you find out that there are places um, where there's actually a game that you can play. You can take a break from reading and, and play a game like this with Monster Builders, where you're going to put syllables together and build a word um, and see them create, um, come together. And at the end of each chapter, you find out that there's actually three choices that you can go to next in the story. And in that way, this, this short story has actually 500 different threads, 500 different ways that you can read it. And we think that this is going to help to make it a little more engaging, a little more fun for, for kids to read. But there's a lot more to this. I realize that because this is an, a story that's built into a computer, we can have the computer track how well the person is reading. Now, it's not to be stealthy or weird. It's to be able to look at who's reading well. And if you're not reading really well with this story, and when you go to the next chapter, what we'd like you to be able to do is keep reading. So if the software figures out that you're, you're, you're struggling a little bit, that next chapter will be presented to you with simpler vocabulary, less sophisticated sentences. So you can keep going with the story. If you're reading really fast, and you're really proficient with the games, then I'm saying, well, I don't want you to think this story isn't for you. I don't, think, I don't want you to think it's, it's too simple for you. So when you go to that next page, it's going to be more challenging vocabulary, richer sentence structure. And this way, we can make the story adapt to your reading level and challenge you to keep improving. And I think this type of adaptive reader creates an opportunity not just for kids to learn in the classroom, but also for adults to think about ways to read where you need important information and maybe your reading level isn't where it should be. We saw that with the, the great depth of, of disparity within the adult population as well. So in this way, I think we're trying to take abilities that we take for granted, that we can all read, and realize that there's new technologies, not just the alphabet, not just a paper book, but new things that we need to do to keep trying to invent to improve things for the future. All right, that's it. Thank you.